Hi, this is Paul Turner with Eventify, and today we're going to talk about Secure Shell, or as it's more commonly known, SSH. And specifically, what we're going to be talking about is our SSH keys. To do this, it helps to have a little bit of background on SSH, so let's just start and understand kind of where SSH is used. Let's say we've got a server, in this case a web server, and it's providing services to a variety of people. It might be customers, partners, employees, or just one of, of those. Um, those users are connecting up to a web page. Um, they're doing it securely, so they're doing it over Transport Layer Services, or TLS, which is an encryption protocol. Um, often you may have heard of it as SSL or HTTPS, right? So this is all secure because it's a very important application, whatever they're using. But the server, it needs to be administered by um, somebody or a group of people. And typically that's done via the command line. And what you'll have is you'll have uh, one or more administrators that log in via the command line. Traditionally, uh, or in the past, historically, they would have done this with Telnet. But Telnet was found to be insecure. Basically, um, when you logged in, uh, you would put in your username and password, and that was passed in the clear over the network. And so the SSH protocol was invented to replace Telnet so that uh, you could first, for example, identify the server that you were connecting to, make sure that you're putting your username and password into the correct server so it doesn't get intercepted, and also so that your username and password was encrypted over the wire so that somebody couldn't intercept it. And these administrators, they may be application owners, system administrators responsible for the entire system, um, or a, an administrator with root access. This may in fact be the system administrator. Um, but what you'll find is SSH is typically used by privileged users, users with um, higher levels of access, if not root access on a system, which obviously makes SSH a very important protocol, something that you want to make sure you understand. In addition to the ability to use SSH as an administrative protocol, it also provides the option for automated operations. Mm -hmm. Let's say that we have this system that um, is connected to another server. Let's say that here, this is uh, the sales server where, for example, the salespeople are putting in all of their sales figures um, at the end of the month. And we want to make sure that we collect all those figures and send them to the accounting server so that the monthly or quarterly financial results can be reported. So effectively, what happens here is that this server uh, will have some sort of automated process that will wake up at midnight, collect all these sales results together, and then make a connection over to this other server, and it will do that over SSH. Now, if it needs to transfer a file, there's a couple of other protocols that work in conjunction with SSH. One of them called SCP, the other one SFTP, and they allow for secure file transfer. So what, for example, would happen is this system, once it woke up, would transfer the files over, one or more files, and then it would execute some sort of command to start the processing of those files on this system. And this is a co very common use of SSH. Um, actually, it's used for all sorts of different applications. The, the one I just gave you is just you know an example to make it real for you all. Now, you might ask yourself, OK, so now I'm getting a better idea of SSH and what it's used for, what the capabilities of it are. What types of systems is it typically used on? And it turns out that it's used on just about any type of system. Um, for example, any appliance, whether it be a router, a firewall, a switch, uh, any type of Linux or Unix, um, an easy rule of thumb that I like to tell people is if it's not Windows or a mainframe, SSH is probably used to log into it. And these days, because of add-ons for Windows and the mainframe, you can actually use SSH to log into both of those as well. So SSH is very broadly used on frankly, just about all mission critical systems. And by virtue of that, it's really important to understand how to use it effectively, how to make sure that you're using it securely so that it actually serves the purpose because it is a security tool. So for this, what we're going to do is we're actually going to talk a little bit about SSH keys and how they're used. So with this, let's say that we have Alice here. And Alice um, is going to be an administrator of a particular application on server one. So she needs access to server one. She's going to be doing this across uh, or using a command line. In order to just get the server ready for any administrator um, to come in remotely, the administrator of server one is actually going to 
go in and generate a key pair. They actually just type in a command and that command will automatically generate this server key pair which is going to be used to identify uh, the server. So in this case what we're going to have is we're going to have a public and a private key. Now when Alice connects up to the server the first time via SSH, she's going to use some sort of a tool whether it be PuTTY or the command line SSH. There's a variety of different SSH tools available out there. Um, but when she does this the first time, what's going to happen is that the server is going to go ahead always pass its public key down. And because it's the first time, the SSH client that she's using is actually going to display uh, a kind of a thumbprint uh, representation of that public key and ask Alice, is this the correct public key for server one, this server that you just connected to? Um, because obviously it's very important that if it's not the correct key that Alice indicate that. Now, as you might imagine, um, if Alice is like many of us, like me, she's going to be looking for a way to get this prompt out of her way so she can keep doing her work. Um, what she should do is she should validate to make sure that that is the correct uh, public key, either by calling the administrator or by some other means. But frankly, I, I think it's safe to assume that most administrators don't do that and they just quickly either type in yes or whatever the response that's required to get that prompt out of the way. But what happens now is that now we've stored a copy of that public key with the address of that server so that the next time we connect up we don't get prompted and we always trust that that's server one. And if for example in this case an attacker had gotten in the middle of that situation that would be an issue. Now in addition to this, and let me just provide a little bit more background, this key as I had described earlier, or this key pair, enables Alice to each time be able to identify this server. It also ultimately is kind of a facilitator for being able to set up encryption between uh, Alice's workstation and the server. Once Alice um, you know, makes that connection, now she'll be prompted for her username and her password and she can put that in. But you know, many administrators like Alice, they may be administering 50 or more servers or even 10 servers and keeping track of all the passwords for each one of those and entering them in can often be a, a difficult challenge. And so Alice says, you know, I know about this feature of SSH that allows me to use a key pair to do my authentication instead of uh, having to put in my password. So what she'll do is she'll use her nifty little local program on her, on her uh, system to generate a key pair for herself. This is a, a, a new key pair that's specific to her and she'll generate that and then what she'll do is um, she'll arrange for getting it into her account and this she can either do by contacting the administrator if, if he requires that she go through him to do that or if he's kind of a lax administrator which is frankly more common um, he'll allow her to just go ahead and put that key into her account, into a particular file into, in her account, that allows um, for her to just authenticate without having to put in a password. And so here, what we've done is we've got this public-private key pair. Here's the private key. Here's the public key. She takes the public key and she places it um, in a file called an authorized keys file on the server. And now, each time that she connects up, her client is going to say, hey, wait a minute, I've got a a private key here to use for authentication, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to authenticate into server one using that private key. And because server one has the public key, it's able to go ahead and authenticate that it is in fact Alice. Now if Alice logs into multiple servers as we had mentioned, what this enables now is that now when she connects up to server two, she can go ahead and put that public key into the authorized keys file. Now she can authenticate to server 2. Just to kind of close the loop here, you can see that server 2 has its own set of key pairs, or its own key pair, excuse me, and so now Alice would have been prompted the first time she connects up for server 2's public key, and now she's trusting that. Now we had mentioned that there was another case where um, servers communicate with each other, and in this case what we have is we have an application, for example, on server 2 that needs to automatically do something on, on server 1, and so it's going to connect up. To achieve this, what's going to happen is now the administrator of uh, Server 2 or some user on Server 2 is going to go on to Server 2 and create a key pair for that account 
on server two, right? We'll just call it two here. It's gonna create a key pair for that. And then what'll happen is they need to get their, the public key for that key pair onto server one in the authorized keys file for that particular account. We're just gonna call that account server two. So server two is logging in as server two into server one, right? Now, what you can see here is now we've ended up with quite a few keys, right? And this is a lot to keep track of just with three systems and, and uh, one user and one application, right? And typically what you'll find is there's multiple users, multiple applications per server, and so you may end up with more than one set of SSH keys um, that are being used. And what you end up with is frankly quite a mixed web of connections that are enabled by SSH that allow for automatic login using this public key authentication. Frankly, in most organizations, more, most organizations um, do not allow by their policy users to use um, public key authentication, as it's called, um, to authenticate in the servers. However, frankly, because this is not well policed, many users do use public keys um, to, uh, public key authentication to authenticate in the servers. More importantly though, many organizations require that if automated applications are going to be doing SSH connections um, between uh, systems, that those do use uh, SSH uh, public key authentication. But what you can see now is what we end up with is a very broad set of these, and most organizations have no inventory of these. Um, because of this, they're very hesitant to rotate any keys because, for example, if they've got trusts set up between multiple systems, let's say that this system is connecting up or being connected to by these systems or vice versa connecting up to those systems, and we go update all but one of those and then that application wakes up in the middle of the night to perform an operation, it will break because it won't have the correct key. The key will have been changed. And so what will happen is ultimately we'll have an application that fails. And so what administrators have learned to do is never rotate these. And many SSH keys have been out for many years, never changed. This results in weak keys being out there. Also, if you have employees that are terminated, since these are never reviewed or changed, they will still often have access, which is obviously in the case of privileged access users, very dangerous or somebody that was working with an application that had privilege access and was able to make a copy of that private key before they left. They, though it wasn't their private key, they were able, <coughs> excuse me, because they have access to it, to use that. Finally, you can imagine that if an attacker breaks into one of these systems and can leverage these connections between systems, they can start to do what's called pivoting they can pivot from one system to the next and keep moving throughout the organization um, to get to a broader number of servers. So this can allow what was initially an, a compromise of one system to spread very quickly across multiple systems. So with that, we hope that this has provided a good overview of SSH and a, and a basic understanding of how SSH keys are used both for servers as well as for users and some of the challenges that result um, from the use of SSH keys um, in many environments. Thank you very much for joining us.